You know, I was thinking as I was sitting there, a lot of times I get up here during that little interim and it's like, I want to start preaching these songs. And I was thinking, I literally believe that I could sit there with my phone and type out a message based on the songs and just get up there and preach a message based on that. But you know, it's encouraging to me because I've explained to the church, the music ministry, when we first started this church, when we went, we used to play music on a little phone and we've been believing God that we'd have a music ministry and it gets a little bit better every time we turn around. But you know, one of the first things that I always said and the best way I know how to describe it is, is that our music has to preach the gospel. Yes. Music has a message. I don't want you to know that. And I mean, that's why I'm always like fussing about secular music. I'm not getting into that right now. But I just need you to know music has a message. Amen. Some people are like, yeah, but dude, I'm not even really listening to the words, man. I just kind of like feel the beat, you know. And no, that's, can I just say it like it is? It's a bunch of garbage. It's a lie. And I, I don't mean to come over here and poke you in the eyeball this morning, but I'm just here to tell you that's a lie. You're not going to just feel the beat, my man. My, my, my sister, what's going to happen is, is that you're getting lost in the beat, but at the same time, the lyrics are being driven into your spirit, man, being driven into the soulish realm of your heart. And if the words are not lining up with the right message, then that is that is becoming part of who you are. And so and, and it will come back out of you. I'm here to tell you that this morning it will come back out of you. And a lot of the music, even in the church is not really preaching the gospel for the way that it's written. You know, what, for in order for music to preach the gospel, it should be glorifying God. Amen? It should be glorifying the darling of heaven, Jesus. Amen? We can sing about the Holy Spirit at the same time the Holy Spirit wants to glorify Jesus. And when Jesus is glorified, the Father is glorified. Amen? And, you know, there's even songs that talk about, you know, when I worship you, my problems fade away. Right. And, you know, and there's a truth to that. When you get into the presence of God and you begin to worship the Lord, your problems will fade away. But is the song glorifying the fact that you got something or is the song glorifying the fact that Jesus, amen, made a way for your problems to go away? I don't know, but I'm just trying to make a point that, I, you know, whenever I see these words, I just know that lyrics are so important because they're preaching the gospel message. Amen. I want to minister to you this morning a message that the Lord put on my heart earlier in the week. And this is the title of my message. We're going to be reading from 1 Samuel chapter 8. And we're going to read verses 1 through 20. And uh, but, but first, I, this is my title. It says, my title says, I want what I want and I want it right now. Let's read 1 Samuel chapter 8. I know that's none of you in here this morning. I'm just saying, like, that can be the mindset of a lot of folk, right? Let's read 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 through 20. And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now, just real quick, let me just, let me just give you a little context. I promise I'm not going to do this every, every sentence, okay? But when it says that Samuel, Samuel was a prophet... And from a priestly lineage, okay, but he was during the time frame of King Saul, but he was also during the time frame of King David. This was originally at a time when Israel did not have a king. It was during the time frame known as the Judges. When the children of Israel were released from prison, or we could call it prison, in Egypt and brought into the promised land, there was a period of about 400 years known as the Judges, when Israel did not have a king, God allowed the judges to rule and to judge over them and to judge matters, social issues and things that went on, you know, in daily life. Just like with you and I, if something goes on, we go through the court system and the judge judges. Well, the judges were led by God to judge the people according to the will and the ways of God. And that's where we are in this time frame of this story. Israel's a nation now. She's been brought into the promised land. But we're right here at the transition where we're about to go from the time frame of the judges into the time frame of the kings. All right. So Samuel was old. He made his son judges over Israel. Now, the name of his firstborn was Joel and the name of his second was Abiah. And they were judges in Beersheba. 
And his sons walked not in his ways. See, Samuel was a man of God, but his sons, they weren't walking according to the ways of, his, of their father. Therefore, they were not walking according to the ways of God. But instead, they turned aside after lucre. You know what that means? That's talking about filthy money. <laughs> See, money's not always filthy, but whenever you have the wrong mindset towards money, it becomes very filthy because it has this element to it called greed. And boy, I tell you, greed will mess you up, right? Money's a, you know, I'm all past you say money's a great servant, but it's a horrible master. And that was a good word whenever you said money is a great servant. When you have control over your money and your money's working for you and your money's doing what it's supposed to do. It's a great servant. But boy, when it becomes your master. Amen. Oh, man, it's a hard task master. Yeah. It's not, and, and that's what they did. They turned aside to, after lucre and they took bribes and they perverted judgment. The judges aren't supposed to pervert judgment. That's why in America, <coughs> the, the lady justice, I've been having these allergy issues. I'm just letting y'all know I don't have COVID. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Lady justice has a blindfold on her and she's got scales in her hands. She's not supposed to be able to see you and the fact that you got a nice diamond ring and a Rolex on your wrist and think, hmm, I'm going to go ahead and, and judge in favor of her versus... In Unfortunately, though, those kinds of things happen, right? Because people are perverted and they're not following after the ways of God. And the same thing was happening in this time frame. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and they came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, you are old and your sons walk not in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all nations. I want what I want and I want it right now. But this thing does please Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord and the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people. That word hearken is an old King James word. But you know what it means? It doesn't just mean listen. Because you know, you and I can, our auditory senses can be in faculty. Like they can be working properly. Get a little vibration on your eardrum and it sends a signal to your brain. Like, oh, okay, I heard that. But no, the word hearken has an added element to it. It means don't just listen to it. Go ahead and do it. Surrender to it. So that's why Jesus would say, hearken. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He wasn't just saying, no, you need, whenever you hear it, you also need to submit to it. Now the Lord said to Samuel, go ahead. Listen to the voice. Submit to the voice of the people and all that they say unto you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me. Because they don't want me to reign over them. They don't want me. To be the king of their heart. I want what I want. And I want it right now. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt. Even unto this day. Wherewith they have forsaken me and they've served other gods. So do they also unto you. Now therefore hearken unto their voice. How be it yet protest solemnly unto them. And show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. So. I want you to go ahead and listen to what they're saying. And I want you to give them what it is that they want. But at the same time, I want you to prepare them for the result of what they want. They need to know that we're going to let them have what they want, but they're not going to be happy with it. You know what's an amazing thing is, and this, is, this goes for all of us, including the preacher, that we can hear the word of the Lord week after week, day after day. We can read the word of God, and yet at the same time, the word of God will, try, will desire to instruct us according to the Holy Spirit, and yet at the same time, we will not listen to it. And the word of the Lord will actually warn us in advance of things that are coming, and we still, isn't there, isn't there oftentimes, Lord help us, but a rebellious nature on the inside of us that says, yeah, but I don't want to do it like that. I want what I want and I want it right now. And, and the Lord's saying, I want you to tell them. And I got to tell you the end of the story real quick. They go ahead and they want, they move forward with their plan. And he says, so Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. And he said, this will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and he will appoint them for himself, for his chariots to be his horsemen. And some shall run before his chariots. He will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties and will set them to ear his ground. That's another word. That word ear right there would really be better translated in modern English as plow. 
He's going to use them to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries. I looked that word up and I thought it would have had something to do with baking, but it really has something to do with like making things that smell good, fragrances and perfumes. I mean, the king is pompous, man. He wants all kind of good little dainty things going on in his palace. And to be cooks and to be bakers, and he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses or your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the, t he's basically taking, he's saying, I'm the, you're the king, you're going to ask for a king, I'm going to give you what you want, but he's going to take your prosperity. He's going to take your children and he's going to take your prosperity. He says, and you shall cry out in that day because of your king, which you shall have chosen for yourself. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and they said, nay, but we will have a king over us that we also may be like all. Look at this. That we may be like all the nations. In other words, I want to be like everybody else, Lord. Everybody else in the world, because you got to understand something. The right context here is that Israel is the people of God, just like Christian today is the people of God. And the nations are the world that don't know God. So whenever you're going to work, whenever you're going to school, whenever you're hanging out with whoever you're hanging out with, if they're not the people of God. Now listen to me. How do you become the person of the people of God? You hear the gospel of Jesus Christ that says that you are a sinner. You hear the word that says he bore your cross. Hallelujah. He took your shame and he died in your place. And when you heard that, the Holy Spirit stimulated your heart and said, yes, yes, that's my truth. Will you surrender to that truth and on that day you said yes Lord I put faith in your will I put faith I surrender my life to you Jesus I invite you into my heart please forgive me of my sin listen to me according to the word of God if you prayed that prayer and you meant business with God guess what happened the Holy Spirit moved into your heart hallelujah he went from being just on the outside dealing with you to living on the inside being with you and in communion with you hallelujah and he wants to change you Okay, now you're the people of God and you're different than the people of the world. Amen? Amen. So he says, he says that we, but, but this is the people of God. And they're like, yeah, but, yeah, but I get all that. I'm the child of God, but yeah, but I want to be like the world. I don't want to be like what you want me to be like, God. I don't like the way your word says I'm supposed to live my life a certain way. I'm free. I'm a free spirit. I got a free will and I want what I want and I want it right now. He says, uh, we want to be like the other nations that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. But the king wasn't supposed to. It wasn't supposed to be like that. The king, and we'll get, we'll get into that in a second. But the king was going to, this wasn't God's will for their life right now. Sometimes it's like, you know, we want something that's not God's will, but then sometimes we just want something that's out of God's timing. Amen. Right. Amen? And, and listen, I'm going to tell you, this isn't really part of my message, but it was God's will to give them a king. It just wasn't God's timing. That's good. It was God. God right now was preparing his king. That's good. It, the king that God was preparing was a little shepherd boy in a field. That God was raising up and teaching him to have a heart that was soft, see, for his people to serve his people because he's a perfect type of Jesus. Amen. Because Jesus is the good shepherd. He's not a hireling. And God was raising up young David as a shepherd in a field to take care of those animals and to love those animals and to protect those animals because he understood that those animals belonged to his father. See, and even when the bear came and the lion came, young David stood up in the power of God and destroyed the lion and the bear. And, and, and once again, his heart was becoming, being taught how to be soft towards the will of God so that he could be soft towards the people of God. 
See, there's a spiritual thought in the New Testament known as the flesh. I want to teach you a little bit about the flesh this morning because this is a big part of my message. The same word is used in many different ways. Number one, the flesh can describe the physical part of man. Real quick, Matthew chapter 24, 22. But what I, you know, we don't have to read it all, but look, except those days be shortened, no flesh would be saved. So we're talking about the physical nature of man. Mark 10, 8. The two shall become one flesh. They, they, there should no, uh, they should no more be two but one flesh. So sometimes the word flesh in the King James Version of the New Testament describes just the physical nature of man. All right? As a matter of fact, it uses the word flesh to describe Jesus. Jesus was born of the flesh. See, meaning Jesus was became man. He was incarnate, not reincarnate. He was incarnate. He became God, became flesh. Just talking about the physical, right? But here's the second part. It describes the sinful part of man that is in opposition to the will of God. Look at Galatians 5.17. It said that the flesh... You could, it says lust against the spirit or the flesh is against the spirit and the spirit is against the flesh. And these two are contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. See, once you're a Christian, you need to understand something. Your flesh is in op your flesh is still there and your flesh is in opposition to the spirit of God. And the Spirit of God, I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, is definitely in opposition to your flesh. But the two of them are, are combating one another and your flesh is trying to get you to go one way and the Spirit of God is desiring to make you go another way or to get you to plead with you to go another way. And that, and that sinful part of man is in opposition to God's will. Amen. Number three, and listen, this isn't all inclusive about the flesh. I'm just trying to give you a little bit of an understanding of the flesh. Uh, I could probably teach on the flesh for an hour easily, right? But it, this is number three. It describes man living or making decisions outside of the spirit of God. And you need to understand something. The flesh of man is tainted by sin. And so there's a part to man that wants to make decisions outside the will of God. You know why? Because my flesh lusts after things. Now, when you hear the word lust, do you automatically think of lying with a person that you're not supposed to lie with? Like I'm talking about sexually, right? No, it's not always regarding that. And really the word lust describes desires. Sometimes desires can actually be good. Sometimes they can be bad, depending on the context. But a desire for anything that is ungodly is a lust of the, it would be a lust of the flesh. Your flesh is desiring something that, that's against the spirit of God. I mean, we could list off all kinds of things, could we not? Amen. Amen. I'm going to, I'll probably be listing some things here in a little bit, but in the meantime, just go ahead and fill in your own blank. The things that you have desired that you not, weren't necessarily supposed to have. Like in other words, the Holy Spirit would say, no, don't do that. Or don't do that right now. But yeah, what do I do? I choose to move forward with my plans sometimes. Lord, help us. So it describes man living or making decisions outside of the spirit of God or the will of God. Romans 8 1 says there's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. You know, I didn't really plan on doing any writing on the board, but let me just say that, you know, I know I draw this kind of stuff a lot, but sometimes I try to make it different. This is supposed to be you and I the first time we're born like Adam. We're broken, we're dead, we're dead in sin. We're not alive to God, we're not alive to the Spirit of God. Our flesh is ruling and reigning at this point in time. But whenever we heard the gospel, right, and we got saved, we heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. Okay, this is Jesus. When we heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, we put faith in that and it changed everything. The word of God says in the book of Colossians that we were translated from darkness into light. Something spiritually, a spiritual miracle happened on the day that you were truly saved. If you've never truly been saved, then you then you may you won't understand what I'm talking about. But if you have truly submitted 
your life to God where you said, yes, Lord, I do want you and you meant business with God, then you know what I'm talking about because the Holy Spirit lives in your heart now. And even though you might not be doing everything that you're supposed to be doing right, you know you're saved because you aren't the same. And even if you're doing things you're not supposed to do, you're being convicted about it. Now, listen, there's a chance that you have moved forward. I want what I want, and I want it right now. And you've continued to do that every day for the last three years. And now your conscience is seared as with a hot iron. And you're not even being convicted about it anymore. You could still be saved, but better be careful, child of God, because you're heading in the wrong direction. Amen. Preach it to the preacher. Amen. So when you hear the word of God and you get saved, guess what happens? Now you're in Christ. I'm about to break that scripture down for you. But I want, first, I want you to see this. See, first you were in the world. What did that scripture say right here? It says in Romans chapter 8, there's no more condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. See right here, when you were in the world... You were bound with guilt and condemnation. You were guilty. But now that you're in Christ, you're in a new place. And in this place, there's, you're, you're considered righteous by God. So you're in a new place. You're in Christ. You're in Him. But guess what? Now, I can't really draw uh, action too well. But let's just pretend for a second that these are the footprints of this person that's walking. Because, see, you're in Christ, and now you have to walk this thing out in Christ. Amen. And as long as you're, you walk according to the Spirit and not the flesh, you're not going to feel the effects of condemnation. You're not going to be condemned, amen, with the world. You're not going to be judged with the world because you're in Christ, and you're being led by the Holy Spirit to go in the right direction that the Holy Spirit would have you to go. So, but sometimes the word flesh means it describes man living or making decisions outside the spirit of God. Romans 4.1. What shall we say then that what has Abraham our father found pertaining to the flesh? A nothing. The scripture goes on to say nothing. Abraham could not accomplish. Now, don't get me wrong. Abraham did make decisions in the flesh. But what God's talking about right here and he messed up and he had to pay the price for it. But that's not how he got his name, father of the faith. Abraham got his name, father of the faith, because the word of God says he believed God and God accounted it unto him as righteousness. Amen. So Abraham didn't find anything according to the flesh. You can't make decisions in your flesh outside the spirit of God and the will of God and expect to receive the reward of God. And look at Romans 13, 14. It says this. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at that. you got to put him on. He's like your new garment. Amen. He's like, a, he's like clothing. You know, what, this is such a powerful concept that's really been ringing true in my ear for, ear for the last year. And that is this idea of participating with the Holy Spirit. If you understand the message of the cross and you understand that what Jesus did has already accomplished the will of God in your life and that when you believe that it allows the Holy Spirit to move in your heart and in your life. That is a very powerful thing for you to understand. But can I tell you something? You can't just sit back in a pew somewhere waiting for everything to happen to you. You got to joint participate with the Holy Ghost. You got you have to be willing to submit to the will of God and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Have your way in my heart and in my life. That would, that's what it means to walk according to the spirit of God. He says, put on the Lord Jesus and make no provision for the flesh that you would fulfill the lusts thereof. So the flesh, again, has lusts or desires that it wants that are outside of the will of God or the spirit of God. That last thought is the main essence of our story. When we make decisions for our lives according to what our flesh wants rather than the direction that the spirit is leading it results in problems in our life. In many ways, Saul, King Saul that we read about, he is an Old Testament picture of the New Testament thought about the flesh. You with me? Don't, don't let me lose you now. Saul is a type of the flesh. He's an Old Testament character that is like the, that describes the flesh. We can watch Saul's life and we can see elements of the flesh. Well, what are you talking about? 
Well, when we contrast Saul and David, we gain a picture of the difference between the flesh and the spirit. Let me give you a couple of examples. We're not going to turn there. But real quick, there was a time when Saul needed victory over a nation and he was supposed to wait on Samuel to come to offer up a sacrifice. See, the king was not allowed to offer up a sacrifice. It was the priest's job to offer up a sacrifice. But the people of Israel knew that in order to have God with us, we need to go to the sacrifice. In order for you and I to have God with us, we need to go back to the cross. Amen. We need to trust in what Jesus did for us at the cross because that's what makes us righteous. What Jesus did at the cross and when our faith is right, it puts God's power and strength in our lives. And so the children of Israel, even though they didn't know all this New Testament stuff we know today, they knew God wants us to offer up sacrifice. But Samuel's not here, and he's just waiting around, and he's not showing up as fast as I need him to, and so I'm the king, I'm going to do what I want, and I'm going to do it right now. And he offered up his own sacrifice. Well, that was the worst mistake he could have made, because the Lord said, I have rejected Saul, because he did his own thing. He did not wait according to my plan, and so that was the first step, that's a type of the flesh. I didn't, I'm not going to wait on God's will. I'm just going to go ahead and, and, and take it for myself. Also in the Goliath story. Do you remember the Goliath story? He tried to get David. Nobody wanted to fight the giant. We're not going to go there. I love that story, but we don't. Nobody wanted to fight the giant. Young David walks up on the scene. He's like, what in the world is going on? This giant needs to fall today. And Saul says, oh, you found, you found your, a young little whooper snapper that's ready to go fight the giant. Okay, bring him over here. Let me put my armor on him. Saul tries to put his armor on David. Now, I think that there's a whole lot that can be said about that. And I was actually just thinking this morning, why you won't put your armor on David? Because you hadn't even been willing to fight the giant yourself. But not only that, I'm starting to think, man, this kid's brave. Maybe if I put, maybe by some chance he might win. And if he does, everybody's going to think I did it. See, because the flesh wants recognition. But that's a whole other preaching message. That's not really what. But that is a good point. The flesh wants recognition. I want to be recognized. I want you to see me for how good I am. I want you to see me for how important I am. I want you to know I'm the smartest guy in the room. I want you to know whatever. I'm the best looking dude in the room or the best looking girl in the room. I want you to know I'm the coolest person that you know. I, I want you to know that I built this. I did this. I, all this. kind. No, it's a bunch of garbage. It's flesh. Flesh wants recognition. The opposite of flesh. And want recognition is to humble yourself. Mm -hmm. David said, These things here are not tested, and I cannot fight like this. David said, I know how to fight, and it ain't like this. Mm -hmm. See, the way I fight is I'm in the middle of a field with some sheep, and I'm strumming a harp, and I'm writing psalms unto the Lord. And whenever the enemy comes against me, I rise up in the name of the Lord. In the same way the lion died and the bear died, that giant's going to fall today. And he went to him and he said, you come at me with spear and sword, but I come at you in the name of the Lord. It's the Lord that's going to win the battle. And you and I need to learn that. Amen. So, But there's another type of the flesh right there. And in the story that we're reading this morning, the flesh is focused. Really, this isn't. Saul is the flesh, but look, the people want the flesh. See, it's the people crying out for that. We want what we want. Well, you're about to get it. You know, you and I are supposed to be different than the world if we're saved. You know why? Because we have the spirit of God to lead us according to his word. His spirit and his word give you and I an advantage that the world can never have. The world can never have that advantage. Unfortunately, like the world, our flesh can want things that aren't God's will. And the desires of the sinful heart can supersede the desire of God's spirit for our lives. That's possible for every last one of us in this room. Also, we can choose not to study God's word for ourselves. Now, this is very important. Listen to me. Listen to me, Christian. If you're sitting in the house of the Lord this morning, if you're watching on video, it is your responsibility to study the word of the Lord. You want to find a preacher and you want to find multiple preachers that preach the gospel for the way it's written. And you want to listen to those preachers because listen to me, you can learn a lot in one hour of preaching. Amen. Because these preachers, if they're doing the right thing, have studied hours and hours and hours in order to present what it is that they're presenting. 
And, and, and so you can learn, but you, but the word of God says that a workman that rightly divides the word of truth will not be ashamed. It's your responsibility. It's my responsibility to learn the word of the Lord. I keep going back to it time and again, because I just don't really know how else to say it, that the world has a message and the church, the kingdom of God has a message and the world is disseminating its message to the world. Whether it comes through music or Hollywood or, listen to me, right now, and I'm not trying to get political. I'm not here to, I'm not. I'm not going to get political. I'm just going to tell you some things that are going on in the world right now, in this nation right now. And you can go look on whatever news channel you choose to look on. But there was, there was two different Congress women that have made these two comments recently. And they said, oh, no, whenever you see them, go get in their face, cause commotion, cause frustration until we bring down this, this, I don't remember the word that they use, but this organization that is, that's not right and that is suppressing people. And so here you have a congressman that just went to one of the conventions and when he was leaving, the crowd saw it. And this is what they did. They said, look, we got Rand Paul. Let's get him. And they went and they, they surrounded him and they almost knocked the policeman down that was trying to protect him. And what they were saying was, and I, I'm going to tell you, I'm not getting political on you, but I'm here to tell you, we got a problem because all this is contrary to the will of God. God doesn't want you trying to take things by force. God wants you and I to humble ourselves under the hand of God. And, and here they start saying, say her name, say her name. And they were talking about this woman that was unjustly killed in her home on the couch. She was a paramedic, if I'm not mistaken. I can't remember her name. Does anybody know her name? Because if you go, huh? Brianna Taylor. Brianna Taylor. So I said her name to give her respect because what was done to her was wrong. There was a law that allowed the police without a search warrant to go into her house. And you would think that after all the trouble you got to go through to get a search warrant to go into somebody's house, you'd have the right address. No, they didn't. And they killed her. And it was wrong. It's wrong to kill an innocent person that's minding her own business after she's been working all night, saving lives, sleeping on her own personal couch in her own personal apartment. It's wrong. Amen. And the people that did it need to, need to be disciplined for it because it's just wrong. Amen. But what they didn't know is, is that the very congressman that they're, that they're doing this to literally wrote a law into existence and got it passed in the name of the law was Breonna Taylor Law. To change that law. They didn't even know how ironic is that? How weird is that? That the crowd would, would jump on this congressman and say, we got him. Let's get him and push him around and try to exert fear in him. And he's the very person that actually passed the law named after her to reverse this thing where they can just go in there at will. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that whenever you see these kinds of things going on, this is not the will of God. Amen. This is division. This is anarchy. This is chaos. Right. And God is not about division, anarchy, and chaos. He is not. He is about love, unity. Does that mean that God's people always get it right? Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, a lot of times God's people are viewing something from the wrong direction. That's another story for another time. I'm just trying to say that the, like the world, our own flesh can want things that we're not supposed to want. Also, we can choose not to study God's word for ourselves. That's where I was. And be left with the mindset that the ways that we've been taught in the past or the ways that we've handled our business in the past are still okay for today. What I'm trying to say is, <laughs> is that if you think it's right, it's, it's wrong for, for, for people to just be killed unjustly, then you're right. Uh, yeah. Because that's wrong. According to God's word, that's wrong. But if you think that it's okay to cause upheaval in society to get your way, you're still wrong. Amen. Because that's called seditions and heresies and divisions and it's a lust of the flesh and it's against the will of God. 
And so that's the point that I'm trying to make is that we can still have a mindset that's against the will of God. But the Holy Spirit, see, we have an advantage that the world doesn't have. We have the Holy Spirit and we have the word of God. But if we don't study to show ourselves to prove, we can literally be taking a stand and think that we're taking a stand on the side of God. When in reality, we're completely out of God's will. We got so many people, listen to me, that say that they're Christians that are going to vote for a for a politician that's pro that's for abortion. Hold on a second. I don't ever preach about abortion. I don't ever talk about abortion. I should talk about it more. Give me a break, man. We're talking about killing an unborn life. We're talking about a heartbeat on it. Who do you think you are? Women's choice? No. You know what you're doing is you're buying a lie from a mindset of the world. It's not a woman's choice. A woman doesn't give life. No. God is the giver of life. God is life. It's not the one. You know what that is? That's pagan idolatry that says that a woman is the giver of life. That's the that's the goddess Diana. That's the goddess Artemis. Some rock that fell from a sky that was full of things that looked like breasts. The full, the many breasted one. She's the giver of life. She sustains life. That is a lie from the pit of hell. A woman is not the giver of life. She doesn't have the choice to make over her own body. God gave her the life to begin with. That life on the inside of her is the life of God. If you don't want to have a baby, quit having sex unprotected. Quit having sex out of wedlock. Wedlock. Start lining up according to the word of God and you will have this mess. But what you got is a spirit of antichrist in the air, causing trouble, causing confusion, causing division. That's what you have going on. And it's contrary to the word of God. And you got people that believe that they're Christians. And Lord, help them. I'm not trying to fuss at them because they're deceived. They genuinely probably do love God. But if they would have spent enough time in the word of the Lord and not walked according to the flesh and instead walked according to the spirit, they would have realized that they was wrong. And that they were being led by a different spirit. It wasn't the spirit of God. God will never contradict himself like that. God will never be okay with murder or killing an unborn life. It's not gonna, he's not going to be okay with that. How do you get that hard? You know, it's sad that, to think that I fell in love with an animal like this because I never was a dog person. I love that dog so much. And sometimes when I look at this dog, I think to myself, man, that poor dog is only going to live about seven years. I, the dog's only one year and three months old, and I'm already thinking about that. I know it's weird. What I'm saying is it's going to be hard for me if that dog gets old and looks like it's hurting to put that dog down. That's a dog. Really, dude? It's a dog, yes. But yeah, we're going to kill a baby. Don't kill the whales, but you can kill the baby. I didn't even have nothing about abortion in my mess. But the Lord wants us to know that there's a spirit out there, and it's a problem. That's right. you, listen to me. Well, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to cause that. I'm not going to be a divider. All right. When the reality of, when the reality is that they are fleshly thoughts and decisions that we gain from the world, and if we have read and studied the Word of God, the Holy Spirit would have convicted our hearts. The Holy Spirit would have convicted our hearts if we would have taken the time to get into the Word of the Lord. Whenever you read the Word of God, the Holy Spirit will show you where you're wrong. Amen. And and He will convict your heart and He will give you God's wisdom. Amen. Amen. The perception of what is good and right or what is considered a blessing is skewed when we try to judge those things based off the world's wisdom instead of God's wisdom. In other words, when we look at the world and see what the world is doing and we say, oh, look at that. That's the blessings of God right there. Well, wait, hold on a second. Does it even line up with the word of God? See, God prepared Israel before they left Egypt by letting them know that his word and ways would keep them close to him and the blessings of God's people for both today and tomorrow, I'm talking about eternity, have always been connected to being close to him. Let's look at this scripture right here from the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 8. This is right before the children of Israel are about to leave Egypt and God is about to bring them into the promised land. Do you realize that if you got, if, are, you, are you a true believer? I don't need you to raise your hand. But in your own heart, you know whether you are, right? 
If you are a true believer, do you realize that if you got on a plane today and you flew into the, I don't know, let me just think of a place I've been, Amsterdam. You flew into Amsterdam. That's a, ooh, that's a rough place. That made New Orleans look like it's a child care, daycare center. Okay, you flew into Amsterdam. Do you realize that the king of glory still lives on the inside of your heart? And that wherever you go, wherever your feet tried, you should be bringing Jesus with you. Amen. You are the child of God and the spirit of God liveth in you. And wherever you go, you should be bringing Jesus with you. Now, my point being is, is that the children of Israel are leaving Egypt and they're the people of God. So wherever God is bringing them, they're going to be representing God. And this is what he tells them. He said, I'm going to give you my word. If you get on a plane today and you land in Amsterdam, you got the word of the Lord in you. You got something. Amen. You got the spirit of God. You got the word of God. You can do some work for God. You can accomplish God's will in your life. But look what he says. Behold, this is Moses talking. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments. Talking about the word of the Lord. Listen, that's, that's what Israel had as far as the word of God. God's ways that he taught them according to the law. Amen. Even as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do so in the land that, that he's bringing you to go possess. Keep therefore and do them. In other words, know the statutes and judgments. Know the word of the Lord. And whenever you get over there, I need you to live your life according to what I've taught you. This is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. Here we go again. The children of God, the children of Israel, and the nations. The nations are all those people that don't know God. You, under, you, you know how bad it is today? Have you tried to talk to anybody about Jesus out there lately? It's, it's bad, dude. People are so confused right now. There was a time probably 20 years ago that you could talk to somebody about Jesus and they'd be like, man, I'm right there with you. They might not have been serving the world. I understand what you're saying. And they could have probably told you all kinds of stuff about what people believed about Christianity. Nowadays, people are so confused. I've talked to people before when I was out there witnessing for the Trip and Patrolling Festival. They're like, man, I ain't never even heard of Adam. Who are you talking about? Never heard of Adam? Don't know the difference between Jesus and Buddha. They so confused out there and Lord help them. And that's how the nations were back in those days. And that's how it is in America today. People don't understand. But see, you having the statutes and judgments of God, you having the word of God on the inside of you, you having the spirit of God on the inside of you, it is your wisdom and your understanding that you have been given from God. What does the word wisdom even mean? I'm getting a little deeper this morning than I planned, but what does the word wisdom even mean? Do you understand that before you can have wisdom, you have to have knowledge? Wisdom is the proper application of knowledge. That means until I open this book and begin to learn it, I'll never have the knowledge of God on the inside of my head and my heart. If I never have the knowledge of God on the inside of my head and my heart, I can never apply the knowledge of God in a real life situation. <laughs> that means that if I'm in a situation, okay, here's an example. Uh, here's an example right here. Whenever... I got saved. The Lord said, Matt, for you, if you drink. Now, listen to me. I don't believe that the Lord wants any of us drinking alcohol. And let me tell you why. Because in our culture, alcohol is associated with the party. The party is connected to worldliness. How are you going to live your life in such a way? I know because I done tried it. I'm not here to convince you. You got to be convinced of the Lord. I done tried to sip wine and be a Christian at the same time. And I remember when the pastor's son caught me in Tampico's drinking red wine. He's like, oh, and I tried to hide it behind this little thing. Why? I mean, if it was okay, why did I feel so guilty? I don't know, but I did because the Lord told me drinking wine for you is a sin. I tried to hide that glass of wine behind that little thing they had on the table. He come over there. He's like, man, I didn't know you drank wine. The problem with Matt is drinking wine is when he gets about two to three inside of his gullet, he don't act the way he's supposed to act according to this. Amen. Oh, he acts like a whole different person now. Mm -hmm. You think I'm free now? Oh, you ought to see me all liquored up or on something I ain't supposed to be on. I start acting completely different. Looking at folk different, talking at folks different, acting different, acting like the world and not the Lord. See, the knowledge of God said, according to his word, you that drunkenness is a sin. Do, do not, and the word of God says, Ephesians 5.18, be ye not filled with wine, but be ye filled with the Holy Ghost. See, wine will diffuse into your bloodstream and it'll begin to change the way you think, the way you feel, the way you walk, the way you hear, the way you see. 
When you let the Holy Spirit diffuse into your spirit, man, he'll begin to change the way you walk, the way you see, the way you hear, the way you act. Mm -hmm. The knowledge of God, though, first. Now, see, now I got to have the knowledge of God first. And then now when I'm in that situation, sitting at, I don't know, ca well, Cafe Milano or whatever with all the doctors. And now that I've arrived, because, see, I used to just be like a little wine head on the side of the street drinking a quart of beer. But now I got a master's degree in nursing and doctors drink wine and I'm sitting here with them. And it's time for me to now I can handle it. <laughs> and they're all drinking wine. And we're we're now of a different cultural setting. Would you like a glass of wine? Why, certainly, sir. I would like a glass of wine. That would be great. <laughs> That's not what the knowledge of God said. <laughs> Knowledge of God told Matt that he's not supposed to drink a glass of wine. Amen. But you know what the good news is? Is that even though Matt drank that glass of wine and one glass turned into two glasses and three, then three and then like six months later he's drinking beer again in the backyard looking at people's stuff on the computer he ain't supposed to look at because he opened up the door and now he's not acting like he's supposed to act. I learned from that. Yes. I learned a valuable lesson called wisdom from that. Yes. And now the next time when I sit down at the table by the grace of God and they say, would you like a glass of wine, sir? Look, you've arrived and you're, you know, no, sir, I don't need a glass of wine. But hey, thank you. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't even have, the other day I was doing something, another kind of work kind of thing. Hey, man, I got some water. I got a beer. Mm -hmm. No, no, that's okay. Thank you, though. I ain't got to make you feel all weird, dude. I don't drink no more. I'm born again Christian. No, I ain't got to even make you, I done gone past all that. I ain't got to make you feel weird. You're still in the world. You don't even know any better. Amen. Amen. But, but alcohol ain't going to make you act like a believer. It's going to make you act like a partier. And if you don't like that message, I don't know what to tell you. I'm sticking to it because I know what the Lord showed me. Amen. It's going to make you, especially in South Louisiana, my friend. It'd be one thing if you was living in France or in Israel and you was mixing your stuff with wine and you was weakening it and you was drinking it because the water over there was going to kill you with dysentery. And so you need a little wine with it for, to make your belly feel better. But that ain't what it's about. In South Louisiana, it's all about the party, boo. And it's all about getting your buzz on. And it's all about changing things like that. All right. Anyway, I didn't plan on preaching on abortion or alcohol, but here we are. Wisdom. You got to have knowledge first before you can have wisdom. And then once you start to apply wisdom in your daily life, guess what happens? You start to gain the understanding of God. You start to think more like God instead of the way that you used to think. Amen. So Israel had God's word and ways from the law that he had given them. And God promised them that if they would follow his instructions, there would be blessings for them. But in addition, God would receive his glory because these other people or these other nations, the world around you, would realize that there was something different about God's people because they had his word and they were so close to him. As a matter of fact, I didn't read that last part of that scripture. He says, he says, for this is your wisdom and your understanding. This is back at Deuteronomy chapter four, verse six. Keep the statutes and judgments because this is your wisdom and understanding in the sight of those nations out there which shall hear these statutes. How are they going to hear it? Because you're going to say it. And say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Surely this guy, Robert, is a wise and an understanding person. I'm not going to tell you all about Robert's past. He can tell you about that. Even though he gave me permission. Robert's thing probably wasn't drinking. It was stuff with some other stuff. But I guarantee it didn't make him act like a Christian. But the people that know Robert from his past would say, they, they, they may not always say this, but I guarantee you there's sometimes they're like, if they would hear what the Lord's telling them, look at the wisdom and understanding that this guy has. What, what other person do I know that's this close to the Lord? He used to be this way and now he's this way. Because now he's living in it. It's not just Robert, it's every last one of us. That's the testimony. I love that song. Jesus is my testimony. My wife told me to quit singing. She said, you can't hit a note. She said, you're singing more and more. You got to stop. I was hoping they were going to let me have a mic, but it's not going to happen. Jesus is my testimony. When I stand up here or whenever I, whenever I'm out there while the song was going on, I was thinking to myself, yeah, but what about what you did back in 1985? What about what happened to that girl that you were dating and da 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 and it was your fault and you did this? What about what you thought about this morning? Jesus is my testimony. Yeah. See, that's what a testimony is. 
It's kind of like I'm up here giving you my version of the stuff. Jesus is my testimony. That's what I'm pleading the calls up in this courtroom, buddy. Jesus is my testimony. He's my story. He's the one that changed my life. Amen. We just need to be convinced that what we want is God's will. Amen. No, no, thank you, sir. I, I don't want that. Well, what would you, you know, you don't believe in drinking? No, sir. You, now that you asked, actually, I don't. And let me tell you why. See, I learned something from the word of the Lord and the Lord told me that this was not going to bring me to the places that he wanted me to go. But guess what? I rebelled against the Lord and I learned the hard way. And what it did was it brought me down a path. And now I realize that what I really want is Jesus. I don't want that. And if that stuff's going to keep me away from Jesus, I definitely don't. Right. Mm -hmm. If it's just going to keep me that much away from the Lord, I don't want it. But see, I can't convince you of that. Nobody else can convince you of that. It's nobody else's job but the Holy Ghost. Just don't get mad at me for telling you the truth. Amen. Amen. So you want to say, what nation is there so great who has God so near unto them as the Lord our God is in all these things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that has these statutes and judgments? What kind of people is it that would be so great upon the land and have the very word of God living on the inside of them? Praise God. So Israel had God's word and had his ways. And listen, for the New Testament Christian, I don't even have time to get into it. I preached way longer than I expected to. I thought this was going to be short. Mm -hmm. But according to the New Testament Christian, the Holy Spirit lives in your heart. And Jesus said that he, the spirit of truth, will show you all things. He's going to take of me and my truth and he's going to reveal it to you. Amen. And that's the purpose of God's people, to reveal Jesus to a lost and a dying world. But in the story that we read, we see that God's people are upset because things aren't going their way. Samuel's sons are judges. They don't like the way that they're leading. They go to Samuel and they tell him that things aren't right and that the way they, they want it fixed and the way they want it fixed is that they want a king. You know, can I tell you that there's a lot of things in life that aren't right? Amen. Can I tell you there's a lot of things in life that aren't fair? And if you let the devil have his way in your head, you're going to get so frustrated with how unfair life seems that you're going to make choices to try to fix it yourself. And that would be your flesh instead of the spirit of God. Instead of trusting God, you're going to try to fix it yourself and then you're going to create a problem. The issue here is their response. They're viewing what the world has and they want to be like the world. But God's word says you have my ways and my word and I have a certain way that I want things done in the lives of my people. We're not the world and it's not okay for us to make decisions the way that the world does. And when we do, it's going to have negative effects in our lives. I mean, there's a lot. Listen, Israel's crying out for a king, but guess what? For a single woman in the church, she cry out for a husband. Give me a husband. There's nothing wrong. Uh, I'm not trying to say a husband's a bad thing, but watch what you ask for, sister friend. Come on. Because look, look here. I know I'm a man. And men are a mess. I'm not saying there ain't no good ones out there. And I'm not saying that a man can't be a good thing. But Lord, you, I didn't know I was getting myself into this way. You should have just taken your time. You should have trusted me. You should have held on to me. You should have stayed focused on me. Instead of staying focused on what you thought was going to be good and look good. And now look what you done did. Amen. Oh, you wanted a man. The rest of the world's living in a big house. I want a big house. Okay, go get your big house. But can you even afford it? Do you have enough money to even pay for the house? Uh, the rest of the world's driving a big car. The rest of the world's living in debt. Okay, well, if that's what you want to do. But now you're in bondage to debt. Yeah. Those are just some simple examples right there. You know, just because everyone else has it doesn't mean that it's God's will. He said unto him, behold, you are old. They said unto him, behold, you are old and your son's not walking your ways. Now give us a king so that we could be like the rest of the nations. They wanted something that the world had and they wanted it and they wanted it right now. Right. They, and they were unhappy with the things were. So they imagined in their minds that the way to remedy the situation was to get a king like the other people had. But God's will was different for them at that moment in time. Whether people like it or not, God has a plan, amen, for his people. Yeah. Let me say it like this. If you see something you want and you go after it and it's not God's will or timing, it's going to result in frustration, not peace. Yeah. 
I'm not saying that it's not God's will for you to have a wife. I'm not saying it's not God's will for you to have a husband. That's not what I'm saying this morning. What I'm saying is if you go try to get all that stuff outside of the will of God, you're going to find frustration instead of peace in your life. But you're going to swear to yourself that you think that that's the, well, that's, no, no, this is exactly what I need right now, preacher. Yeah. The second thing I noticed was this, is that the Lord said, go ahead. He told Samuel, go ahead, give them what they want. Verse 7, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7. And the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken to the voice of the people and all that they say, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me. You know, the flesh re rebels against the will of God and a spirit of rebellion goes in its own direction. And as painful as it is, God will allow man to rebel and suffer the consequences of his decisions. One of the reasons that God allows this is because it's part of the learning process. It's part of learning the will of God. Wrong decisions cause pain. Pain hurts. And I don't like living somewhere that hurts. Amen? We learn these things. God allows it. God's, God's good. And God is merciful. We're the ones that have the problem. Amen, church? I hope you can agree with me. We're the ones that have the problem. When we see what the world has and we want that rather than what God's word says, then we are rejecting God. If we demand to have those things, he will let us. But when we get them, it will never turn out the way that we expect it if it's outside of God's will. All right. Point number three, you will become a servant to your choice. He's going to take your sons and he's going to put them in the military. He's going to take your daughters and he's going to put them in the kitchen because he is the flesh. And the flesh demands to be served. The flesh is never satisfied with what it has and will selfishly demand that others give it what it wants. The flesh will never be satisfied with what it already has. It always wants more. And it's going to scream out for more. And it's going to demand more. And it's going to reach out to grab. But yet the spirit of God is always going to be selfless and serving. Amen. Amen. He says he will take the tenth of your sheep, verse 17, and you will be his servants. The flesh will take what belongs to God and use it for itself. That's the, that's the tithe right there. The tenth of your sheep, that's supposed to go to the Lord. The king's going to take, the flesh will take what belongs to God and will use it to serve itself. This is the last thing I want to say. That whenever we do this, I'm talking to the preacher this morning too. For every last one of us that would hear this message, when we make decisions like this, whatever they are, buying more car than we can afford, buying more house than we can afford, getting hitched up with, with the person that the Lord didn't have for us, moving in a direction contrary to the word of God, whatever that is, you fill in the blank. I can't do it because every little aspect of your life, God is concerned about. Yeah, that's right. But when we do that, when we make those decisions, and then we don't understand why. But they don't turn my daughter. They put, he put my daughter in the kitchen. He put my son in the military. Or I'm not happy now with the way things are. But, but, but the word of the Lord told you not to do it. Mm. Don't blame God when you don't feel, when you don't like the fruit of your choices. Mm. Amen. Is that fair? Amen. I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully that's fair for all of us. Because we're all going to make choices that are fleshly, but it results in something. Amen. And let's not blame God when it doesn't go the way right. that we wanted it to go. Mm -hmm. Verse 18, you shall cry out in that day because of your king, which you shall have chosen for yourself. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. Some choices that we make in life can't be reversed immediately. Some choices that we make in life can never be reversed according to the will of God. And the results of those choices can lead to great frustration and we want out. But God's will says you must remain and serve me even if your situation doesn't change when you want it to. Amen. You know, I saw this other story. I'm closing with this little story right here. There was that. Well, I'm just going to tell you, I was watching the Republican convention. I watched both of them, so don't be judging me. I watched both of them. And there was this African-American lady. And I don't remember the front part of her story, but she was arrested and had some kind of a drug charge. It was a nonviolent drug charge. And she was sentenced to, I think Danielle said, five life sentences. 
for a nonviolent drug charge. Oh, wow. From what I understand, it was Kim Kardashian, according to it. I think Kim Kardashian brought it to President Trump's attention that this happened. He got people to look into it, and it was the thing was unfair. He passed le he ha helped to pass legislation that got her out of prison. And his daughter was up there introducing him for the thing, and she made the comment. They had the woman up there speaking. And, and, and while she was in, she served 21 years in prison. Wow. And while she was in prison, she went and got her education. She became a pastor, a, a Bible teacher. Wow. And so she made a choice that, you know what, this is what's happened in life. I can grow bitter and I can grow frustrated or... I can serve the Lord. And as far as she knew, she was never getting out of prison. She never knew that the Lord was going to let her out of prison. And whenever they went, so Ivanka, his daughter, said that the president was there. And she said, I know my daddy. And she said, I could see the emotions was welling up in his face. And I wouldn't think he shows a lot of emotion. But this is what she said. I could see the emotion in his face. And he just turned to me. And he said, how many more do you think are like? And she was so grateful. I guess I'm just trying to make a point right here because it had to do with that. Sometimes the choices we make, they can't be reversed immediately. But even still, when we realize that maybe we did make a choice that resulted in pain in our lives, it's not God's fault. If we're willing to be real with ourselves, we will realize that there was probably a time when the Lord, with a still small voice, said, don't do that. Don't go that way. Trust me in this. Go this way instead of that way. But instead of listening, we went our own way. Right. Mm -hmm. I just want to encourage you this morning because sometimes we feel as though, you know what, we're not going to be able to get out. But God will be with us. Yes. I guarantee you he was with that woman in that prison cell. Yes. And he will be with us wherever we are if we would just trust him and serve him through it. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come to you in prayer this morning. Maybe somebody watching on video, you say, man, I've never been a child of God. I've never received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. If you believe that the word of God went forth and you believe that Jesus is the answer, you just have to invite him in right now. Yeah. Let the Lord know. Say, you want to, I want to let you in my heart, Jesus. Please forgive me of my sins. Please forgive me and teach me to walk with you. Maybe you're out there in this crowd this morning or you're watching on video and you would say, man, I've made a lot of choices like that. A lot of choices that have probably sent me down the wrong way. And well, I want to start making some right choices. That's my prayer this morning. Lord, help us all to make choices according to your word and according to the spirit of your word. Lord, give us a hunger and a desire for your word. That your word would teach us your ways, Lord. And that we would desire your ways and not our own. I pray that prayer for every single person that would hear this message, Lord. And I pray that you would strengthen us and encourage us in our walk with you. And once again, I pray for this great nation, Lord God. That you would be the Lord over it, Lord God. That you would rule and reign and that your will would be done, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.